So we're going to start off this morning with something a little bit musical, but also looking at partly the work of really the mentor of this conference, John Michel. And our next speaker has also been working along with Colin Bloy of Fountain International um, and various other people like Hamish Miller and Paul Broadhurst. I've known this next speaker for a very long time. He's uh, been friends with the conference for a very long time. And this is his first time to speak here. He has a book out called Sacred Sites, Sacred Songs. But his main focus is on a project called the World Healing Project, which he's been running for 17 years. And he's also a musician and singer. Um, and his latest album is called One World. And some of these are available, obviously, after the talk in, in the, the area where the stalls are. So we're very, very pleased. And please give a warm megalithomania welcome to Giles Bryant. Great to be here, everyone. So we are going to start with a little bit of music just to get this, uh, get this going, get this vibration going of the perpetual choirs and returning the perpetual choirs once again to Avalon where once it was singing out. So we're just going to have a little bit of music to start us off and I would love you to join along. Coming to the stage, it's Juliet Bryant. Give her a round of applause, please. Okay, so the song goes like this. Ah, ha, ha. Your turn, megalithomania. Ah, ha, ha. And then I go. Ooh, ooh. Your turn, people. Ooh, ooh. And then I go. Your turn. Mm -hmm. My go. Ah, uh, uh, uh. Let's hear ya. Ah, uh, uh. and together with the R. Ah, uh, ah, uh. and then the U. Uh, uh, uh. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh. To the north and the earth Strength and stability To the east and the air The breath that we breathe The south and the fire Burning desire To the west and the water Cleansing energy We sing Ah! Can you hear the beat? Stomp your feet, come on, yeah. Great spirit above, the light of belting, come on, yeah, 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 yeah. To the love space within us, to the heart, let it shine. May the love shine. Through the ley lines, come on, may the love shine, the healing of the world. One more time, ah, ooh, come on, ooh, and, mm, oh. Give yourselves a round of applause, everyone. Thank you very much. Well, thank you ever so much. Thank you, Hugh, and all the team for Megalithomania. Can we just give them a round of applause, everyone? What a fantastic event this is. I'm really pumped to be here. I really, really am. And as Hugh said earlier, I'm really representing here uh, some incredible people. We stand on the shoulders of giants. And it was a, a great privilege of mine to spend time with some of these, uh, these giants of this 
world. You know, there's, there's no megalithomania without John Michel. You know, he coined the phrase, he, he wrote the book on it, and, and, uh, and the team have set this up in his name. And I was privileged to spend time, particularly in the last few years of his life, with John Michel at Sacred Sites, and he was so passionate about the perpetual choirs and sharing this information. And my talk today is about that. It's about the living tradition of the perpetual choir, something I've been involved with for over 20 years now, all over the world, looking for evidence of the perpetual choirs, which I'm gonna share with you guys, and also tying it into this fascinating connection of sound and megaliths. And I know some, some of you guys are really into this, uh, so thank you so much for coming as well. So let's get into it, shall we? Here we go. Sound as a creative force, all right? So Yogananda says, sound or vibration is the most powerful force in the universe, right? At the start of the Bible, in the beginning, of the, the Gospel of St. John, in the beginning was the Word. And what is the Word? The Word is this great vibration, right? The Word is God, and Krishna says that in the Bhagavad Gita, I am the Om. What we've just been chanting there, Om, Om. The sound of the universe. And one of the most powerful things I can share with you here, and it's very, very simple, okay? Our intention plus the sound brings the manifestation of healing. All right, I'm just going to say that again. Our intention, yeah, plus the sound brings the healing vibration. To spread it out. We're going to go into detail about how that works. Should we just try that now? Because, you know, it's a troubled world out there, isn't it? For many people. Difficult times, and that's why I'm so passionate about spreading this information about the perpetual choirs, because it's one of the main solutions that we've got, returning this awareness, returning this knowledge to the world. So let's try this. I don't know how well the old mics are going to pick this up. Can you hear that? Okay, so how about we have an intention of peace? Yeah? Are we up for that? Yeah. We're up for that. Okay, what about peace to the world? So we're just going to make this sound. Ah... Let's have a little practice. Beautiful. Okay, so let's have that intention. May peace flow to the world. May peace awaken in all hearts. One, two, three. Ah. So Plato said, in the golden age, man was governed not by law, but by music. And John Michel writes about how in the old days, people didn't even know about government or need government because we were kept in harmony, in tune, in rhythm, by this perpetual choir, by being in harmony. And we have different traditions of these creation myths. You know, Apollo produced the harmonies that joined all of nature together in peace and joy. And all cultures that I've experienced and visited have used sound, not just for entertainment, which is the main thing now, right? We talk about music and its entertainment, but not just from that, but for awakening of consciousness and for healing. How about this? All of creation is a singing matrix of frequency. Everything is energy which vibrates, right? Every single thing is vibrating. Everything is vibrating energy. So if we can get in tune again with that cosmic vibration of harmony, we've got it. So that's what we're going to be getting into a little bit later. Music is liquid architecture. Architecture is frozen music. These things are completely related, as we're going to get into in more detail. Uh, Professor Emoto, we've all seen his work. I'm sure how you start to see the, you start to see it, right? You start to see it. Seeing is believing. So we've got this, these sound vibrations and how they can affect the molecular structure of water. Here we go. This was the uh, the dam, and the Buddhist monk had prayed to it. Look what happened. This is when you say bad things. Uh, this is some music of a Maria Omnama Shiva creates these ancient chants, create these uh, things. Of course, I'm sure we're familiar with the cymatics, the vibration of the sound waves on the plates to create this sound vibration, okay? 
So let's get into the perpetual choirs now. I was in Saffron Walden in Essex, in the, uh, the old Sun Inn. It was a bookshop at the time. And there I found this book here, John Michel's City of Revelation. And in it, John talks about the circle of perpetual choirs. Now, when I came across this information, maybe it's about 25 years ago, it just felt right. It just, I, I just felt it was, I'd already, I, I always knew it, and I was being reminded of something. Is anyone familiar with that idea? You come across something and you already knew it. Yeah? Some of you. Okay. Well, I found this with the perpetual choirs. And there is some uh, debate about the origins and the accuracy of what John Michel discovered, and several people have already spoken to me about uh, this during this conference. Well, one thing I want to point out about John Michel, he was a mystic, and his information came through many sources. Of course, he was educated at, uh, at Eton and Cambridge. He was a very bright man. Never completed his studies at Cambridge. They don't often tell you that bit. He'd had enough of it. You know, he did one year and he was off. He just wanted to have a bit more fun and uh, study what he really wanted to. But John was, a, John, was the, well, John was the guy that re-saw the St. Michael line, this, the most famous ley line in the world that Hamish Miller and Paul Broadhurst wrote the Sun and the Serpent book about, and they doused the energy of the Michael Mary lines. We live in Suffolk near to Bury St. Edmunds, just near to the Michael line. So John's interpretation of what was written in the, the Welsh triads. These are the oldest writings that we have, where they refer to three sites of perpetual choirs, where there were 100 people for every hour of the day and night. And they refer to this as 2,400 saints. This is a tradition way before Christianity, was preserved in the Christian tradition. And the three sites that John interpreted this to be yeah, on this little diagram here, uh, which is uh, Clantwit Major, just to the left, Glastonbury and Stonehenge. Now, John, I don't know if anyone ever met him, but he would often have a calculator in his top pocket in case he needed to work out any calculations wherever he was. He hated computers and uh, internet and all that sort of thing, but he, he quite liked his calculator. And John recognised that there was a particular angle between these sites, 144, one of these mystical numbers, and also the particular relationship of, uh, for example, Stonehenge going up is the summer solstice uh, sunrise line going to Goring on Thames. And from these points, he detected the centre point, the white leaf oak, which is in the Malvern Hills, um, which is an absolutely fascinating place. So let's... Uh, Let's get into this a little bit more, this, this idea of these circles. But first of all, before I talk any more, we are here in name of John Michel. You know, this conference is inspired by him. We've got a lecture about him later on, which is wonderful. But how about if we could bring the old master back to talk about the perpetual choirs himself? No, I've not, I'm, it's, we've not got a channel or anything. We're not, you know, we, I know we're in Glastonbury, but... Anyone like to hear from John Michel? Yeah. Some of you at the back, a few at the back, okay. Well, I got to interview John at his home uh, in Notting Hill many years ago, and I asked him about the perpetual choir, so let's hear from John now. Can I just ask about the perpetual choirs? Because obviously Stonehenge was, was mm. reputed to be one of the perpetual yes. choir sites. And is, is that was the perpetual choir circle part of a, the megalithic culture, in your opinion? It goes back a long way. I think yeah. The tradition of perpetual choirs, that is, uh, teams of choristers singing, keeping up a chant day and night, probably reflecting the, um, the passage, the, the, the events in the heavens and such, it goes back a long, long way. And uh, yeah, Stonehenge was reputed to be a site of a choir, so was um, the place in South Wales, Lentwick Major, was another one, Glastonbury. Um, and then there are many sites with, with 
with traditions of the choirs uh, and uh, keeping up a keeping up a perpetual uh, ritualized chant um, in Wales a place called Bangor which means choir petrol choir yeah it was uh, uh, it's part of what I call the enchantment of the country when when people were held in a in a within a pattern of ritual and music and such sure I think part of what I want to do is try to recreate that, or do, but for the modern age, yes. and sing the songs of this age. Yeah. Um, to help, you know, bring that harmony in the same way that it was before. Mm. <laughs> My little project. What are you saying? Just sing the songs of today. Whatever, yes, we should do more singing, quite right. Yes. And sing together. That's, That's it. Yeah. There you go. There is the old master, John Michel. Round of applause, please, for John Michel. There we go. Let's get, give it up for John Michel. He was clap, almost clapping himself there, wasn't he? So the fascinating thing about this centre point of the white-leafed oak is that it is in the middle, right at the joining point of the three counties of Herefordshire, Worcestershire and Gloucestershire, and that these three counties have what they call the Three Choirs Festival, which is one of the oldest... Uh, festivals in the whole of Europe. You can see here the, the angle, uh, the 144 degree angle, which got John's mind sort of uh, going on this. And then that alignment uh, between uh, Clambwit Major and uh, Whitecliffe Oak, but also uh, the alignment going towards Goring. And again, this uh, like Bangor, the place of the choir Goring, it's got this. Um, in the name, it, it, it represents this. Um, so the actual circle itself, the, the decagon, it's just, uh, there's um, Kleinfurt Major. It's, it's fascinating that they, it uh, houses a collection of these ancient stones. We're going to get into stones a little bit more later. But these old uh, Celtic stones, which are, are very similar to megaliths. Here we are. Glastonbury, the, uh, the site of the perpetual choirs, apparently, and the... The, uh, the Mary Chapel was there where the choir was. And, uh, oh, sorry, there we go, Stonehenge, which uh, we're going to re-explore a little bit later on about Stonehenge. Um, and there was the oak very close to Ragged Stone Hill. Tragically, uh, no longer there. Um, but its energy is there. Its energy is there. And there's some crazy character there. He's climbed up it playing his flute. There we go. Right in the centre of the, the Malvern Hills there, close to Ragged Stone Hill, which was described as a megalithic city. There is the uh, Decagon of John Michel. If you want to know about the precision of this and the geometry of it, of course, our dear friend Robin Heath co-authored this uh, wonderful book. He's, I think he said there's 10 copies left. And books are very important, aren't they? Yeah? I like to have books, I like to have CDs, I like to have uh, albums. I'm not really into this, you will own nothing and be happy. You know, I, wanna, I, I, want, I want this book, right? <laughs> so when I want to look at it, I can look at it and this information's in there. And uh, so Robin, uh, of course, did the surveying with, with, with John as other people have done. The perpetual choirs are a mechanism to create and maintain a divine spell or enchantment. A chant brings the enchantment over the whole country, okay? So let's say we've got about 100 people here today, and they say at some of these perpetual choir sites there are 100 people at a time, specially trained, all right? So let's just think about this for a moment, all right? From where we are in Glastonbury, the heart chakra of the planet, connected with these energy lines, these dragon lines, all around the world. And I just want to talk a little bit about the interconnection of these things. So as Hugh said, I spent time with Colin Bloy, the founder of Fountain International. He was the guy that taught Hamish Miller how to douse, as well as thousands of other people like myself. And when John Michel um, brought back to the world this idea of uh, ley lines, of these energy lines, of these magnetic lines of force spoken about in feng shui as these dragon lines in the Australian tradition of the old folk, the song lines, uh, the geobiologist Rory Duff refers to them as sound lines. Colin Bloy 
had this thought, we can douse for water, we can douse for oil. What about if we douse for a ley line, right? So he's in Sussex, and he's got, he gets his dowsing rods, and he detects a ley line. And he's like, oh, here we go. And he's got a ley line, and it leads him to a standing stone. And he thought, brilliant. And then it led him out onto a crossroads. And these are these, some of these traditional lay marker spots of Alfred Watkins and, you know, the lay hunters and all this, right? And then he finds himself in the headquarters of the Conservative Party. <laughs> and he's thinking, hey, up, I thought ley lines were focal points of these ancient sites, linking these ancient sites. And what he was to discover was, no, they are focal points of consciousness, of activity, so you have football stadiums that are on these energy grids. So Colin was able to find himself to a lost church in Andorra. It must have been in the late 70s. And he knew that these ley lines were there and you could douse them. So they had access to this ancient church and they thought, let's experiment. So they got people in the church and they had an old record player. And they thought, we'll play some music. He'd been at his son's Sunday morning service and the children were singing the Gregorian chant and he doused the energy line going into this chapel and it was so wide. And then they were all singing the Gregorian chant, you know, and the line expanded massively. It was interactive with the consciousness and the activity of the people got, taking place there in these beautiful buildings, acoustically designed buildings. And it expanded massively, and he thought, wow, the, the sound is the thing that's affecting the ley lines. It's interactive. It's the sound, that's it. Because several hours later, the line came back again in its power. So he finds himself in Andorra, and he thought, right, it's the Gregorian chant. We'll play the Gregorian chant. So he puts on the record player, and then they had people dousing, you know, down the way. It did, it worked again, it expanded the line. Wow! It must be the Gregorian chant, they think, encoded with these particular frequencies. Some of you might know the story of the Saxon monks of Glastonbury, where they were singing their perpetual choir, they were singing their ancient chants. And the new abbot comes. Do you know the story, some of you? The abbot comes along from France, the Norman abbot, and he says, no more with your ancient songs. You will now sing our songs. And they refused and they were slaughtered at the altar. They held on to their chants with their lives. It was so important to them. This tradition was so important. Maybe it's these old chants, he thinks to himself. And then they had some other records there. And he says, I tell you what, let's play a different one. And he played Jesus Christ Superstar. The bit when Jesus is going in, Hosanna, Hosanna, right? And he played that and the line exploded even farther. Hold on, he says, how can a rock, rock opera outdo the Gregorian chant? And then he says, I tell you what, why don't we just try something else? Why don't we just, and they held hands, let's just be in a state of love. And the line, boom. It is not the music per se. It is the effect the music is having on the consciousness of the people. Okay? It is not the music per se. It is not you've got to tune your guitar to 432 or sing sacred chants. If you're singing something that you're feeling, then the, the, the transformation is happening. This was the information that came back to them. Okay, so let's reconnect this to the perpetual choirs. If people singing in a chapel can have this incredible effect on the ley line, dowsers have done experiments on these ley lines that run through football stadiums. Wolverhampton Wanderers is one of them. And Robert Plant from Led Zeppelin, who's very interested in the perpetual choirs. He's a Wolves fan. So anyway, they're in Wolves, right? They're giving it up. And the ley line expands massively. But then it comes back. Let's come back to this, guys. Yeah? Intention plus sound brings healing. This time, should we focus on love? Yeah? yeah? Love for the world. We're up for that megalithomania? Yeah. Yes, we are. Because love is the healing, right? 
So from our hearts to the hearts of all, yeah, with that ah, deep breath in. Ah. Let's feel that love going into the heart chakra around the planet. Ah. Love and healing for all. One more. Ah. So we've done experiments with human consciousness and Taoism. And we did this one at the yoga show once in Olympia. We built a peace circle. Because I'd learned about these ideas, I thought we are going to test it out. Okay? So Olympia is like a soulless building in London. Okay? Like an exhibition centre. And the yoga show, I had my yurt in the middle. We had people praying for world peace, chanting and meditating. And we had a top dowser there from the British Society of Dowsers. And at the start, there's an energy field created by our activity in the middle of this building, anywhere. Colin Bloy said you can temporarily create the complex dowsing patterns of a great cathedral in the middle of a field with several people with the right intention. Okay? So we had a few more people than several with the right intention, and he was dowsing it, dowsing it, dowsing it. And it felt good when you were sat in this circle, yeah? We created a good vibe. And it expanded and expanded, and by the end of the three-day event, the whole building was in the energy field. We are like fish in water. You change the water, it affects the fish. We all live within this base energy field of the planet. And the experiment they did with the Fountain International down in Brighton. Some of you know the story. The mods and the rockers, they're smashing Brighton apart. The healers get together. Can we do something about this? Let's give it a go. We know that we have these plexuses, these chakra, these nodal points. The planet has them. Towns have them. In Brighton, the major one is where the fountain is. Anyone know Brighton? The old Stein fountain, Queen Victoria's fountain, built on the old stone circle. It's the major point. There's a big ley line going through it. They had 100 people, interesting 100, again, like the perpetual choirs, they said they had 100. They were meditating. They chose to do it on the Archangel Michael's Day, St. Michael's Day. And it, they meditated, and they said, may there be peace, you know, they visualised the light, love, healing for all. And the mods and rockers came down, and they were going to smash it up. But when they came down to Brighton, they didn't feel so aggressive. And the headline of the paper says, Bikers go home, Brighton too boring. <laughs> they went to Hastings and smashed that up. <laughs> so the people in Brighton said, this is what we've done, give it a go, and it spread around the world. They took it to Berlin. West Berlin, they were meditating. East Berlin, they couldn't do it officially. And Colin was dowsing the energy lines. And because of his work, he had access to East Berlin. And there was a, a pattern in the energy lines, which was at the time a seven in the West Berlin. And it was a one in the East Berlin. So they got them meditating, yeah? Brrr. Do you know what happened when it was the same? What happened to the wall? Was it a big war? When it was, a, was it a load of hassle? It was had a concert there. Anyone remember it? We can have peaceful change in the world with the right intention. So, <clears throat> let's bring it up to date. I find out about this stuff. Now, this is the John Michel circle, if you like, that he discovered. About a year after, a mystic called Peter Quillier discovered the Eastern Circle. They called the Western Circle the Circle of Spirit. They called the Eastern Circle the Circle of Power. So, you see that point there? A bit like the, the boobies there, look. In the East, that's where I was living when I found the book for John Michel. I happened to find myself living there. And these circles are fascinating. So, this is the book here by uh, John Gibson 40, big up to John Gibson 40, on the perpetual choirs. And uh, he writes about these circles in it, but his main concern was dowsing the Western Circle, okay? So, 
let's just go through some of these places, okay, on these circles and talk a little bit about uh, some of them as well. So, as I said, the point on the left in the middle is, is said to be at Ring Hill. Some people say it's at Ring Hill and uh, it's near Audley End House, which is a, a royal palace, the, the finest royal palace in England at the time before it was a, an abbey, a Benedictine abbey. And the point in the centre circle there is the white-leafed oak, ragged stone hill uh, in the Malvern Hills. But there are some very significant points. Let's just start with the right-hand side circle there. 13 Canterbury, the uh, home of the Church of England, of course. Uh, you come round to Tunbridge Wells and Guildford. You go up there. 18 is um, by... Uh, 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 sorry, 20 is by um, Oxford, near Oxford again, a great place of power. You can see up just to the north there, just past 17, there's a bit there that's in the sea, and then it goes to a place called Seahenge. Anyone go up there on the Norfolk coast? It was an upside-down tree circle, 4,500 years old. Absolutely fascinating place. We talked about a goring um, Stonehenge, uh, Glastonbury, and to Clamwit Major and up through Wales. But it's not just the points themselves, these geometric points of these decagons that are significant. It's the, it's the places that you find around them. So this is Strata, Florida. Has anyone been there? It was the... Well, of course you have. It, so I think only a few people have been there. It's the Glastonbury of Wales. Okay? So when I'm doing my perpetual choirs tour... Uh, which I did, I made, and I, when I learned about this, I thought, I've got to do something about this. So I spent four years making this album, The Perpetual Choirs, with amazing musicians around the world. And I put the map on, because I wanted to tell people about it. I wanted to tell people about The Perpetual Choirs, right? Because if a few people like us, ah, let's do it again, ah. Imagine we did that for an hour, got a bit tired, got a cup of tea, the next lot come in. When they were dousing and they stopped singing, a few hours afterwards, the energy dissipated. Imagine it didn't stop. They didn't stop singing. That energy would be continuously pumping out, wouldn't it? Like a motor. Does that make sense? Yes. That's the truth of the matter. And that's why around the world now there are perpetual choirs. This isn't some history lesson about what may, might have happened in the past. This is a living tradition. So I thought, well, I've got to do something about this. Got in my van at the time, and I went to every single one of those places. I mean, obviously not 14, that's out at sea. But if you like a bit of Doggerland, <laughs> there wasn't a sea, was there? No. Just go back, you know, several thousand years. So I get to Strata, Florida, and they actually say there in the... This is one of the perpetual choir sites, so it's on, the, it's on the circle, right? It's on the outside of the circle. And they say this was a place where the traditions of... The ancient traditions, the ancient wisdom was kept alive through song, and then they wrote it down. <laughs> this was the perpetual choirs. As John Michel said in that little video, it was this ever-changing connection to the music of the spheres, aligning the celestial harmonies with that of earth, bringing heaven to earth, bringing paradise to earth once again. And this was one of these places. And the centre point of it is absolutely fascinating. Where they were singing, at the point of the choir, you have this well where the spring came up. And this is very interesting with the work of Emoto. They were singing to the water. And that water was percolating out. When they turned up here, the land had been shagged. And they turned up those monks. Within years, they were creating paradise. And they had methods. Graft, singing, right? Neither of them will hurt you. What did they sing? People say to me, well, what were they singing then? So we were giving it a bit of a go, yeah? Uh -huh. Ooh -hoo. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you a quick story. We love singing. We sing to all different sorts of places. So it's you lovely people today. Next week it might be the dementia group. Next week we're in a children's nursery. Next week we're singing at a ve vegan festival. You know, we get around. Weddings, bar mitzvahs, funerals, you know. I mean, I'm up for bookings. Just see me later. 
we're doing a session every, every week for a special needs centre, uh, MENCAP, right? And they had 100 people like this, except for when I say, ah uh ha -huh, and you go, which, you know, you do your best, and those of you watching on the live stream, you know, good effort. But these people are really freaking vibing. Because they didn't have all this, um, you know, they had learning disability, they just went for it. And open hearts. So you go, ah uh ha, -huh, and they go, ah uh ha, -huh. it's like heaven descended. Like a hundred of them. It's full power every week. We all did it for free. We were just giving, giving, giving. Giving the sound, helping, supporting people. I had a big drum, you know, they loved it. We'd sing, everything. One of the team members gets a message. Oh, you can no longer sing your religious songs. You are influencing the vulnerable minds of these people. Oh, Jesus, I thought. That's like 95% of my material, you could say, is in some way religious. <laughs> Necessity is the mother of invention. I'm driving there. What, what are we going to sing tonight? You know, what are we going to sing tonight? So I thought, I know what we'll do. We'll get him to sing the most sacred of all sounds. Om. But if we do that, they'll know. So this is what I did. I had my drum. <clears throat> and uh, can you pass us that drum? Right, so I had a drum, it was a big drum, <clears throat> and I went like this, I went, uh -huh. and they went, and I went, uh -huh. and they went, and I went, uh -huh. and they went, and I went, uh -huh. and they went, brilliant. To be honest, they did it much better than you, but you did your best, and that's what counts. And I thought, ah, oh, smarter than you, you won't stop me. Anyway, so they're all chanting this, right? Uh -huh. And we had the guitar, uh -huh. and it was just, and it would just go off, right? It was like a rave, you know, like it was just full power, right? It was like the Queen's the King's coronation. No, it wasn't like that at all. It was much better. Anyway, freaking vibing, and there's this one girl. And her thing was she never spoke. That was her, you know, thing, right? And she went home to a parent. She hadn't spoke for 15 years. And she went home to her parents and she went, ah, oh, ooh, mm. So this is the power of the sacred chant. This is the power of the, the divine name. And the perpetual choirs, what were they singing? I think it, it, I think it shifted and it changed. And it, it wasn't one, just one thing. It was to align them with the harmony of the spheres. I was with this old uh, Irish priest once, and he said to me, God's bored of the old songs. He wants the new songs. Well, I've been writing them ever since. Continuously writing music. It just comes, as it's always been. We're in India, researching the perpetual choirs, because the Indians like the singing, right? They have this ancient knowledge. And in 19, the 1930s, they started the perpetual choirs again in Rishikesh, in northern India. And we joined them. This isn't just something confined to Britain. So how does sound heal? I'm going to spin through this because uh, we've got loads of stuff I want to share with you. But just two basic things to resonance, okay? Everything has a resonant frequency. What is disease? It's disharmony, isn't it? You are not at ease. You are not in harmony. How do we return ourselves to a state of harmony? Sound is, is very powerful. In the traditions of the devotional yoga, bhakti yoga, there is no difference between the divine and the divine name. So if you want to connect to God, you know, chant and be happy. Another aspect of it is this thing of entrainment, how it can affect our brain frequencies, put us into a more relaxed state. The chakras correspond to the musical scale and the different sounds, uh, vowel sounds, every word has a vowel sound, and the sacred chants have these vowel sounds in them, as well as these frequencies of the actual notes themselves, from the, the low chakra in the C up to the B, and then it continues through the octave. Let's talk a little bit about 432. Who, looks my, who likes my T-shirt? Thank you for that. <clears throat> 
Okay, what's it all about then? 432. Right. So when you tune your instrument, okay, an orchestra tunes to A, and a standardized tuning is 440. Okay? They standardized it because the musicians from Bulgaria wanted to play when they came to Russia and they needed to standardize it. Okay? The ancient people they would have used different tunings and used the intention, but it's it's certainly they were using the 432. Verdi is said to have tuned to 432. Some people said Mozart uh, played to 432. They uncovered a, um, a, a tomb, uh, not really a tomb, like a temple in China, thousands of years old, and they had an orchestra of singing bowls, like these, they, like an orchestra, and they were all tuned to 432, thousands of years ago, okay? Why is it significant? Well, again, this thing of the sacred number, um, Eight lots of 54 is 432, or if you like, four lots of 108. Uh, the square root of the speed of light, isn't that fascinating that it's 432? In a 12-hour day, there are 43,200 seconds. That's interesting. So at the equinox, you get this balance of 432. Uh, the diameter of the sun, now John Michel writes about this, but because he wasn't a musician, he didn't understand 432. His big number was 864. He writes about that a lot in his books. But that's just half of 432, 432 times 2, right? So the diameter of the sun, uh, 864 divided by 2, obviously is 432, the diameter of the moon. You get the point. It would make sense if we tuned to 432, wouldn't it? Yeah. The, way, the reason I know that this matters, it, you can go about the science and vibration and all of this. I used to do a lot of work in schools, and I'd, practice, and I'd play a song in the normal tuning of the guitar, and they'd play a song in the 432, and you could see the difference with the children. And you can't, ki you can't fool them. You know these bright little kids? The crystal children, or whatever you call them, the rainbow children. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Hugh's written a book on it. You can't fool them. They know, okay? So if, you, if you've got a stringed instrument, 432... Gaz was telling me he's just got a singing bowl set, 432. You can buy, you buy instruments in him. That's all good. <clears throat> okay, let's move on. Megalithic acoustics. Can you put your hand up, please, if you have ever sung to a stone circle or a standing stone or in a stone circle, right? Okay, so put your hands down. Who has had a profound experience doing that at a stone circle or a standing stone? All right, so lots of you. Okay, megalithic acoustics. This is just absolutely fascinating, right? People say to me, Stonehenge, you jo you're joking me that they were singing at Stonehenge? Anyone been there in the winter, 3 a.m.? There's a few of you, freaking cold. What, they were singing, the Druids or whoever were singing in the ancient days at Stonehenge? You, really? On Salisbury Plain? And someone said to me, Giles... Maybe they were just so tough that they could do it. And then he said to me, maybe they knew how important it was, which was why they did it. Okay? We've forgotten. Megalithic acoustics. I just want to talk to you about a few experiences that I've had, then we'll go through uh, some of these other things. Recently, we were in Royston. Anyone been to Royston? where the Roy Stone is, the Royal Stone is, right? Now, the nodal point used to be in the cave, the old cave that was used by the Knights Templar, but according to Rory Duff, the incredible dowser, the nodal point has moved because they don't let you sing in the cave anymore because they don't want to damage all the carvings. But back in the day, we did sing in the cave. Oh, yes, we did. Oh! Woo! Dancing with the Michael and Mary lines there in the cave. The nodal point has moved. Why? Because he's intelligent. It wants people to congregate and sing. So we went there. There's only four of us. And we're around the Roy Stone. We took the fag butts out. We cleaned it with holy water. We put the incense on. And we sang. Right by the roads there in Roy Stone. And we sang. It took a bit of time. But then the whole... Cars, bars, shot, it all went. And it was returned to this incredible temple again. 
this that's there. Like the Abbey, it's, you know, on some level it's all there. On some level, it, this system is there. And we re-accessed it, singing to this stone. It was just absolutely, it was profound. We could completely connected into it. Anyone been to Avebury at May Eve? You've been there, he, Lawrence has been everywhere. He's following me about, I'm following him about. <laughs> Paul Broadhurst and Hamish Miller and the Son of the Serpent, they talk about it, right? Oh, and everyone processed there on May Eve and it was just a thing, right? And the sun came up and they lit the beacons down the line from where we are. Hopton on Sea, Bury St Edmunds, Royston, Ivanhoe Beacon, blah, 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 down, all the way. Through Avebury, Glastonbury, Brent Tour, St Michael's Mount, right? All the way up into Russia, the fountain people doused it in Russia. I went there and I thought, I've got to be there for... May Eve, it was a profound experience. I sung to every single stone. And I sung the mantra that they're singing at the perpetual choirs in India, the Hare Krishna mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And then I've moved on to the next stone. The stone made of granite is a lot of quartz in it, right? Yeah? That 90% is quartz. Your mobile phone, I don't have a mobile phone, your mobile phone, got a silicon quartz chip in it, right? Stores the memory, yeah? Your computer. How much information, how much is, is on that little bit of a chip? How much is in the stone? This is a supercomputer. This is a supercomputer. Now, when you go into your mobile phone, you might have one of those pass things on it, pass lock. Yeah? Security, you can't get into it. Can't get, can't get to the, the World Wide Web. What if that passcode is our intention, is our energy field, is our, maybe we, us, a song opens that passcode. Maybe it opens it up to that computer. But maybe you've got to go around to sing to all of them. I don't know, I just thought I would. I had nothing else to do. They're on my own at three in the morning. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. And it might have been the magic mushrooms I'd taken. No, no, I hadn't taken the mushrooms. That's just a joke. After I finished my ritual, and in the tradition of the Indians, they sing their Hari Nam, they sing all around the, they sing all around the sacred temple, the stones, right? This blue fricking light descended from the heavens. This electric blue light descended into all of the stones, like electricity, plugging it all in. A great time of my own awakening was singing to a stone. I think I've got a slide to it. A slide to it somewhere. Oh, coming up. By Audley End House, Hugh and I explored this many, many years ago, the Loxodrome, this ancient alignment of stones. Uh, the leper stone, it's the biggest stone uh, in that part of the world. In Newport, it goes through it got Audley End House, this royal palace. goes up to Wandlebury um, in uh, Cambridge. goes down to Hatfield Forest in, uh, in Essex. And I was by this stone, and I'd come from Glastonbury, and I put some holy water and said a prayer to this stone. And my life has never been the same since. It brought about an incredible transformation. So this interaction of these things. The relationship of sacred sites, we've talked a little bit about this, haven't we, already? Like the song lines, all of these things. Let's talk about uh, Stonehenge for a little bit then. Um, so people said, oh, they were, how could they sing at Stonehenge? I've sung at Stonehenge. I've been there where all the hippies are there, 20,000 people, and I've been there private access. And there is something about it we went there for the Perpetual Choirs tour and someone said, do you know, she was an artist and she'd been drawing the um, stones uh, every day for a whole year. And she said, every day someone comes and sing it, sings here. Every single day someone's turned up. It's you here yesterday, it was the Africans. They got off the coach, they got back on the coach, they left. Why, why, why? Well, there's some recent uh, research for you. Look at this, look. So these boffins, they recreate the stones in a, in a model, a scale model. Okay, 
And they make, they make the model so they've actually got the same acoustic resonance of the actual stones themselves. And then they start doing these sound experiments. Uh, it was the University of Salford. You'd think that the sound would just disappear to the heavens, but there are enough stones horizontally that the sound keeps bouncing back. It's quite magical. You could feel what would have, it would have sounded like in that space. So the boffins at the University of Salford in 2020 have shown that the Stonehenge, like many of these other places, was a freaking sound temple. What I've been saying all these years, what John Michelle's been saying all these years, and people said, oh no, it wasn't that, it was the you know, Abbey of Ambrosius and all this, he just made it up. Well, the scientists are saying something different. Music and other sounds would have been enhanced, that someone standing within the outer circle of stones would have heard the conversations from the centre perfectly, but you couldn't hear it outside. It screened it. Isn't that absolutely amazing? And then Dr. David Keating, and this is some, some old research here, noted that the inner sides had been, had been um, worked. Yeah, the outer ones are rough and the inner ones are smooth. Yeah? It was bouncing the stones back. Like, it was a sonic temple. Okay, our friend Paul Devereux, of course he did his book there, brilliant book, Stone Age Soundtracks, and they went to a lot of these chambers and they found there was a resonant frequency when they were in the chamber. These, these tombs and these, not tombs, but you know, the dolmens. And they have this similar frequency, which is around 108 hertz. Four times 108, what is it? 432. Can you shout that out? 432. Yeah, let's get back to 432 people, absolutely. And what, they, what these people have found is that they actually altered the structures to get them acoustically tuned. These were sonic temples, okay? If you find that in Newgrange, look at the spirals. The spirals were actually reflecting the sounds. And then the relationship of some of these places, there's Royston Cave, um, the actual structures themselves are based on these ratios, these sacred numbers. You see that within the pentagram, the 108 times four is the 432, the uh, pentatonic scale, etc. Cave art. They went to the caves, right? The place where the best resonance is is where they painted those ancient cave things. The cave art. We saw it in Australia. The songlines of the ancient folk. We were hanging out with the old folk, singing with them. We witnessed rituals with those old folk that I've never seen anything as powerful. Three of them, three of those old fellas. Singing. The didgeridoo. What's the didgeridoo? It's a perpetual on machine. <laughs> the old folk understand they're making the chanting the om. But because of the circular breathing, it's perpetual, the perpetual choirs. In Carnarvon Gorge, we recorded at Carnarvon Gorge. It was an Aboriginal festival site. It was the Glastonbury Festival of freaking Australia. They always had food, always had water, chilled out. And there's a place there called the Amphitheatre where they say the rainbow serpent descended into the earth. And the sound the wind makes as it goes through the chamber, um, the perpetual choirs is alive. It's going on right now. We went to Egypt. There she is, bit of a big belly there, baby in the belly. And the priest said, one of the priests said, this was the temple of the perpetual choirs. This isn't a phenomenon in Britain. When Hamish and Paul did the, the uh, Dance of the Dragon, when they did the European St. Michael line, one of the great churches in the Alps to St. Michael, they said there were 300 people there maintaining a perpetual choir. Certainly in Egypt. Chris Street tells the story of when he went to the, the uh, British Museum and there was the uh, uh, mummy of one of the um, pr priestesses of this temple. And he sits there and this, earth, this chant comes back to him. We went to India. We used to live in India. Travelled all over India. I mean, we'd go to India and we'd, be, we'd start singing. They'd see me on the guitar and they'd say, sing, sing. And we're on the train. Hare Krishna. You know. They love it. We came back to England. Jesus Christ, what's happened? Let's bring back the song and the celebration, shall we? Hey, let's do it. There's some fascinating places. This is another place of the perpetual choirs. 
Hampy. Anyone been there? Vijay Anagar, they used to call it the old folk. They reckon there's been a temple there for 80,000 years. How old is this stuff? Right? And up there, they're singing. We walked up there, Juliet and I, it's a big old, big old place. It's like a giant organ generator. It's like a big pyramid, this thing. We're walking up, we could hear a song. J.C. Ram Hanuman, J.C. Ram Hanuman, Ram, 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 <clears throat> J.C. Ram Hanuman. What? This thing isn't just a amplifier, it's a speaker, it's what? The whole mountain was singing. And we went up there, and they're singing the perpetual choirs of the Ramayana. There's me on the train, they just wouldn't let us stop. They absolutely loved it. Singing up the ley line. We live up the end there near Bury St Edmunds. The Equinox, we started singing in Glastonbury Abbey, we finished. We've been singing, singing, singing. That was the perpetual choirs tour. That's uh, Audley End House. Look at that. That's Ring Hill. That's the centre of the perpetual choirs there, they reckon. Some people say. And as it used to be built, look at the royal, like Robin was talking about. Are they tuned into it? The royal palace right through the middle of it. That's the stone I was with with Hugh 18 years ago. There's a temple up the top. They love all that. I thought I'd get into the perpetual choirs. So I enlisted <clears throat> people from around the world. There's the album we made. Stephen Ashley loves singing at Stonehenge. God bless you. I produced his album, The Medicine Path, which you can get out there. See Henge. They let me sing in Canterbury Cathedral. I turned up and they said, oh, it's like £10.50 to get in. I said, no, I'm not paying, love. I'm, like, I'm a pilgrim. I'm here to see Dr David Flood, the head of music. I'd emailed him, but he hadn't emailed me back. <laughs> I'm here to see Dr David Flood. I met him. I'm an amazing man. The bluest eyes. The, he, he, he reminded me of David Icke. Very similar energy to David Icke, this guy. Great man. And he let me sing in the uh, chapter house at Canterbury Cathedral. And I was in there with this girl, she was from the media department, and I go, look, intention plus sound brings healing. Let's try it. Ah, uh, and I went, ah, uh, and the building went, whoa. And the ley lines activated. It's a tourist attraction. It should be a sacred sonic temple of the perpetual choirs. Imagine the difference. In the golden age, man was governed not by law, but by music. Okay? So we started to sing. Anyway, we can, we got people together. And then things happened. Look, the angels came. Did you see that? Look, we started to sing. You see the angel came? And then the rainbow came. You see that? We started to sing. Look what happened at night. See all the orbs? Look, we started to sing there. Look what happened. 300 people. Where we go. Chris Street. God bless you, Chris. That's the uh, Sacred Grove in London, the Earth Star Line in Green Park. That's the white leaf oak. There's me at the top of the temple. It's so sophisticated in India, the, the connection of this megalithic energy, these stone temples. You, you stamp somewhere and the resonance comes out. The return of vibration is absolutely amazing. We lived in India. What are they doing there? They're singing. They're singing around these temples all the time. They've actually got a beat shaped like the Om. And this, this character here, he went from India to Australia and we met up with him and we started to sing. So we've been singing New York City. That was the, where we did the OM thing. We've returned the perpetual choirs. We sung all through the night on the longest night on the winter solstice. Yes, we did. And we got 100 people in London to sing with us. We thought if we can sing through the longest night, we sing through any night. We've been singing, there we go, look. The perpetual choirs, the Archangel Michael song, Freedom... The circle of love is there, another circle that's part of it is in the sea. It might well be the long man of Wilmington. Shout for the long man, please. Just give it up. Winter, the royals love it, don't they? Avebury, people always said, is it part of the perpetual choirs? Probably in Abbotsbury. Do you like the chapel there? Anyone? Of course you do. We've got one minute for a song? Of course we do. Right. We're going to sing now. We're going to finish off. Thank you so much for your love. Thank you so much for your love and attention. I have got some CDs with me. Uh, Roma's got for me, if you want to get a CD. We're going to do a little one-minute blast of love and healing, OK? Because this is dedicated to everyone and everything. We're sending you love and healing. Anyone wants to come up and join me? 
Some of me friends for one minute, okay? This is dedicated to everyone and everything. Sending you love and healing. This is dedicated to everyone. Thank you, Megalithomania! Yeah.